Thank you. Thank you. You guys hear me in the back? Please be seated. Thank you. General Bradley mentioned that he got to speak to Mike Fossum in space, but we got to speak to the Pope from space, which was kind of a very unique thing to do. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Pleasure to be here with you at Lipscomb University, where gravity is a nice, reliable 1G, where I can breathe oxygen at will, and where it would appear that most of you are not space aliens. But to the rest of you, let me just say that I come in peace. As many of you know, I've been to space four times. If that sounds impressive, just imagine how impressed the Martians were when I told them that I've been to Earth five times. A plan plus goals and hard work is the only formula for success. I truly believe that, and it worked for me. Like many of you in this room, I come from a rather ordinary background. I'm the son of two New Jersey police officers, like General Bradley mentioned, who grew up in a working class neighborhood not far from New York City. I wasn't always as focused as I should have been, especially when I was your age. But I learned one thing from my parents, and that was the value of hard work. So I worked very hard, too. While still in high school, I worked full time driving an inner city ambulance in New Jersey. I think it's where I started to come up with a plan and some goals. One of those goals was be, to be the first person to walk on the planet Mars. I really believed that I could do that, and it would be me. That goal set me on a path that ended this year without me ever making it to Mars. But I thought it was a reasonable goal, and I kind of got close. I got to space, but not to Mars. Uh, to get there, I decided that I was going to be a naval aviator. I started flight school in Pensacola just after graduating from college in 1986. Now, this was the year that the movie Top Gun came out, and I was on top of the world. Then I quickly found out that I wasn't Maverick. In fact, I wasn't a particularly good pilot. I really struggled. Forget aerial combat. I couldn't even figure out how to land an airplane on the runway. But soon I'd have to go out to an aircraft carrier for the first time. Now, when the Navy sends you to the ship for the first time, there isn't anybody that's crazy enough to go with you. No instructor, just you by yourself with, other, with whatever skills you've been able to accumulate from thousands, well, maybe not thousands, but countless hours of practice. But I was really, really horrible at this. You know, I'm fairly certain that even Tom Cruise would have been better. And I don't mean the character from the movie, I mean the actor. I failed a couple check rides and barely made it to the point where I was considered safe enough to go hundreds of miles offshore and try to land on a postage stamp size deck in the middle of the ocean. So in, Jan so in July of 1987, I flew out to the USS Lexington all by myself. Now, scary doesn't come close to describing this. The entire experience was just a blur. I still barely remember of any of it today. But I do remember that I was still awful and I barely passed. Now, my point in telling you this is that we all don't learn at the same rate. The student pilots who were great on that day did not go on to become astronauts. How well you do in the beginning of anything that you try is not a good indicator of how good you can become. I'm a prime example of somebody who was able to overcome a lack of aptitude 
with practice, persistence, and the drive to never, ever give up. Your know, life is a set of challenges, and in 1990, I was hit with the first major professional challenge of my life when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. In January of 1991, at just 26 years old, I was sent across the beach for the first time with 12,000 pounds of bombs destined for a hangar on an airfield in the city of Basra, Iraq. Now, you learn a lot about yourself when it's time to do your job while getting shot at. Winston Churchill said about his experience in World War I that, and I quote, there is nothing more exciting than being shot at and missed. Well, speaking from experience, it is pretty exciting, but until you know you're not going to get killed, it's not any fun either. Normally, we all go about our work day, whether it's in an office or, in my case, an airplane, without somebody trying to kill us. Now, I've practiced this hundreds of times, practiced these missions, but as the first missile exploded next to my airplane, this all became very, very real. After encountering a second surface-to-air missile in Iraq, I got the bombs off, destroyed the Iraqi hangar, and now it was time to get out of there. Now, by this point, I really hated these Russian surface-to-air missiles. I decided that I was going to put as much, much distance between me and those SAM sites as possible, so I flew east, or that way. I don't know which way is east. But I flew east into Iran. I was less concerned of the Iranians and went 50 or so miles into Iranian airspace until I hung a right and headed south towards the fleet. My A6 intruder, my airplane, was going as fast as it possibly could. Then I heard our air wing vectoring fighters onto an enemy airplane that was heading towards the fleet. At first, I felt sorry for this poor Iranian or Iraqi pilot that was about to be blown out of the sky until I realized that it was me. The altitude and airspeed of the enemy fighter was my altitude and airspeed exactly. I suddenly realized that I failed to tell my coworkers what I was up to. I didn't properly communicate with them, and I was about to be dead because of it. My failure to communicate on that day nearly cost me my life, so I immediately yelled into the radio, please do not shoot down the moron in Iranian airspace or something like that, because it was me. You know, I learned that there's never an excuse for not letting those you work with let you know what you're up to. All teams require quick and efficient lines of communication. I learned that lesson early, and it nearly cost me my life. Now, I obviously had a risky job as an astronaut, but as my wife, Gabrielle Giffords, entered Congress, for the first time in 2007, I didn't contemplate how risky of a profession that would be. I never considered that she was the one with the risky career. By 2007, I'd flown a couple flights into space. I survived 39 combat missions over Iraq and Kuwait. But as it turned out, she would be the one that would nearly lose her life serving our country. On January 8th of this year, there was no countdown clock. Now, I'm used to lots and lots of preparation for big events, and they usually culminate with the winding down of a tiny little clock on the flight deck of the space shuttle. As that clock strikes zero, massive amounts of fire and thrust sends me hurtling in an instant on a very planned trajectory at a very high rate of speed. Then once I arrive in space, I've got to make multiple critical de decisions that affect the lives of me and of my crew. But on January 8th of this year, instead of a clock, there was just the ringing of my cell phone. My wife's chief of staff called and said simply, Mark, it's Pia. 
Gabby's been shot. Similar to a rocket launch, that phone call sent me hurtling on a path, but in this case with no clear trajectory, but still with multiple critical decisions that I would need to, be, that I would need to make on behalf of this woman that I love so much. Now, as in most careers and in businesses, the ability to make a quick and more importantly correct decision is critical. Whether it's making healthcare choices for your spouse or operational decisions during a space flight or decisions about your company's strategy or budget, like many of you will have to make one day, it's important not to make mistakes. So during the first week of Gabby's care in Tucson, we were making a critical decision on how to proceed with another neurosurgery that she had to undergo, and this one was to her right eye. Now, although the bullet passed through Gabby's, the left side of her skull and the left side of her brain, the top of both of her eye sockets were fractured. And the right one was actually in a lot worse shape than the left and needed to be surgically repaired. So initially, her doctors decided to do the repair by making an incision above her eyeball and performing the procedure from inside of her eye socket. But as the surgery approached, they began to change their minds. Now, we have made more than one poor decision in the history of the space shuttle program, and those poor decisions had clear roles in the deaths of the entire crew. Challenger, that may have been before some of you were born, or a lot of you, in 1986, and then Columbia, that many of you may remember, in 2003. The Columbia accident certainly hit close to home for me because I was the astronaut. Well, first of all, three of the crew members were my astronaut classmates, but I was also the person that you know, had the experience of having to recover their bodies from some fields and the woods and a road in East Texas. So I was determined that we would not make similar mistakes with my wife's care. One of the mantras we now use at NASA is that none of us is as dumb as all of us. So this is a little bit controversial and maybe a little bit confusing, so I'll say this again. None of us is as dumb as all of us. Now, we are all for making decisions as a team at NASA, but sometimes the team will march in a direction that no single individual would take. So I called a meeting of all of our doctors, neurosurgeons, ophthalmologists, the nurses, um, the trauma surgeons, And after the eye doctor explained the procedure and his thoughts on why he now wanted to cut through Gabby's forehead to do this surgery, I reminded everybody of this NASA mantra, that none of us is as dumb as all of us. So please keep that in mind. But then I explained to them, and I went around the room asking everyone's opinion, and I started with the most, the youngest looking, most inexperienced resident, and asked her her opinion because I needed to see if this was the correct approach or were were we marching in the wrong direction as if some sort of group think it had set in. You know, I've learned that often when you don't let the youngest, most experienced person in the room speak first, they won't give you an honest opinion. I've seen this many times. They'll frequently adopt the opinion of the managers or maybe the president of the university and just follow along. So it's my view to always let the junior folks speak first. On May 16th, I climbed into the shuttle, the space shuttle, for one last time, uh, one final flight into space. Now, as you arrive at the launch pad for a shuttle mission, you often, at least I do, think that this might be a big mistake, crazy even. Story Musgrave, a former astronaut and colleague of mine, once said that the space shuttle is like a butterfly bolted to a bullet. It is really a fragile machine. It's actually an airplane strapped to a rocket. And on two occasions, crews didn't return from space shuttle missions. 
It's an incredibly risky business, and the impact to Gabby and my children would be devastating if things didn't go right. So I certainly contemplated, was this worth the risk? Did I really have to fly this fourth space shuttle flight? Now imagine I show you a deck of cards, and you get to pick one card. If you don't draw the ace of spades, you win $1 million. But if you do, then you lose your life. Would you guys take that chance? Well, that is nearly the same risk that we deal with on the space shuttle on every single flight. Those are the same odds. It's actually a bit riskier than a U.S. soldier during World War II as they stormed the beaches on Normandy on D-Day. So it's a pretty risky thing. You know, there's so much risk that astronauts write letters to their families in the event that they don't survive. Now, I've done this on each of my four flights into space. So how do we minimize risk? It's an important thing to do in a risky environment. One of the most critical things that we do, that I do during every space flight, is to pay attention to all of the details all of the time. Never, ever neglect the details. As the commander of a mission, it's my job to do that. It's likely the role that many of you will one day play in your own careers. So don't ever ne neglect paying attention to details. What other ways have we learned to manage risk at NASA and succeed in a very risky business? Well, NASA's very first flight director, a man named Chris Kraft, was very fond of saying, when you don't know what to do, don't do anything. So even in the dynamic, changing environment of a space shuttle mission, it's often better to defer a decision until you've collected a little bit more data, reflected on it, and then you're certain that you're not going to make matters worse. Often waiting can result in an entirely different decision. So it's a sobering experience to climb into the space shuttle for a fourth trip into orbit. You know, after strapping into the seat, we spend about three hours getting all situated, turning everything on. As the clock approaches zero, things start to get really, really busy. At six seconds before liftoff, the space shuttle main engines start. Then when the clock strikes zero, the solid rocket boosters ignite, and with seven and a half million pounds of thrust, you just leap into the air. It's an amazing wild ride that takes you from zero to 17,500 miles per hour in just eight and a half minutes. The best way that I can describe this experience is to imagine that you're on a runaway train going down the tracks at 1,000 miles an hour, and you just keep accelerating. You keep going faster and faster and faster. Now, I often marvel at what humans have been able to accomplish in space. NASA has had many amazing accomplishments, some that you've heard of, many like what we recently installed on the space station, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, you probably haven't heard of. But we've been able to do this for one singular reason, and that's because of our people. NASA has had a long history of attracting the best and brightest scientists and engineers. I've found that over a long NASA and Navy career that it's critical to find the right people. Your success hinges on having people that are smart, driven, decisive, and that are willing to lean forward and take some risk. Now, I've often built my organizations by demanding a few things from the people that work for me. First of all is I don't want yes men or women. I would often tell my space shuttle crews that I am very capable of making a very bad decision that could kill all of us. So they were required by me to question my decisions, everyone. Maybe not always out loud where I could hear them, but I did want them to be thinking if they would make the same decision. And if they felt that they had a different approach, I wanted to know about it. 
So I encourage you to take the same approach now if you manage people or in the future. When you're in charge, tell your people to question you and push back. An employee that will, in, that will challenge and question the boss is a force multiplier. You certainly don't want somebody that agrees with you all the time. I know I am, and I imagine a lot of you are all perfectly capable of agreeing with yourselves. So I also want folks that are able to anticipate in the space environment when there's so much that can go wrong at any given moment, it's important to have people that are able to anticipate, especially when dealing with failures. I want people that are able to look ahead around the next corner and see what problem is out there that's getting ready to kill us. Now, I think this could one day apply to all of you as well. You must be constantly searching for the next thing that could trip you up or trip your company up. Now, while I'm always looking to minimize risk, that doesn't mean I'm afraid of it. I actually would prefer risk takers. I want folks working for me that are willing to lean forward, the kind of people that are more comfortable asking for forgiveness than asking for permission, the kind of people that will chart their own course and take the initiative. These are the kind of people that sent Americans to the moon and that built that International Space Station. And these are the kind of people that can push your organization towards success. On June 1st of this year, I landed Space Shuttle Endeavour at the Kennedy Space Center on its final trip back to Earth. For me, it was an honor and a privilege to have that historic opportunity. One of the most amazing things about the Space Shuttle is that as it comes back to, the, to Earth as an airplane, it literally slams into the atmosphere at Mach 25 and re-enters in this giant ball of fire. You glide halfway around the planet and you have one single chance to land on the runway. This is a challenge for an average pilot like me. Um, so unlike the flight before, Gabby wasn't there on the runway waiting for me this time. She just had surgery to replace the missing piece of her skull that was removed on January 8th. And it would be another couple days before we would be reunited back in Houston. You know, the power of the human spirit is an incredible thing to watch up close and firsthand how somebody can first fight so hard to survive and then fight to come back. You know, she could have given up but she continues to fight every day, every single day, to try to regain what she's lost. She has taught me each and every day to deny the acceptance of failure. You know, I used to occasionally complain to her about this injury or that. Flying fighter planes, as General Bradley knows, for so many years can take a big toll on your, on your back and neck. Um, unable to stop myself, just a few days ago, I mentioned something to Gabby about some part hurting. And she just raised her eyebrow and with just a look said to me, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> on August 1st of this year, I saw the power of the human spirit on display again as my wife Gabby made a very bold decision to return to Congress to vote on the bill that would raise the debt ceiling. Now, this is an issue that she was following very closely for the weeks leading up to the vote, and it's the single vote of the entire Congress that any other member would have loved to be able to avoid. And she certainly had a great excuse, but not Gabby. She has never been one to avoid the tough votes or shirk any responsibility. So at around 10 a.m. of August 1st, we made the decision to try to get her to Washington. It was a mad dash that included lots of moving parts, how to get the Capitol Police geared up, the nurses that travel with her, staff, and then the quick packing of her suitcase while she was away. So let me give you some advice. Once you guys, one day if you're married, don't ever, ever pack for your wife for a trip. 
This is a very high-risk activity. It actually might be the riskiest thing that I've ever done. We arrived in Washington at 5 p.m., and at about 6.45 p.m., Gabby unexpectedly strolled onto the House floor and for just a moment changed the tenor of politics in America. A New Jersey newspaper, the Bergen County Record, may have said it best. After months of rancor and pettiness, one small woman brought Washington to its feet. We can compromise on how we fund America. We cannot compromise on how we define America. That definition does not require words. Just look at Gabrielle Giffords. I want to finish with a final thought, and that's the importance of having a plan as I announce my intention to move from one career as an astronaut to another outside of the Navy and away from NASA, it was important to have a plan. Well, I always have a plan. I'm frequently asked if my plan includes a run for public office. I've thought a lot about that, and I decided that I did not want to go from one career in the vacuum of space to another in the vacuum of Washington at least not yet. But I do have a plan. I have a one-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. I don't always stick to the plan, and I'm frequently changing it. But I think it keeps us focused on those things that are important, not only professional things, but personal things as well. So if you have a plan, make sure it fits on one piece of paper. I suggest all of you do this. Your plan might be to get better grades, to to learn a new language or to take up a new hobby. Part of my plan is to successfully get two teenage daughters through high school without strangling any teenage boys. Now, fortunately for me, my kids tell me that I'm scary looking, and that helps keeping many of those young dudes away from my house. Now, one more thing, there's no substitute. There is no substitute for hard work, goals, and persistence, and just because you're not the best at something now, it doesn't mean that you'll never be the best. Take it from me, a guy who started out driving an ambulance around New Jersey and ended up commanding a rocket ship into space. Thank you. <laughs>